So with little bits of nerves, I don't know how dry my mouth will be, but we'll see how far we get. If we can bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for this time together. We thank you for the, the time and study and discussion that we had earlier as a Sabbath school church family. We ask that you continue to bless as we meet together as a church family and as we look to grow. As we know that we have a passion that we want to reach out to our community, but also be a family of God here where we lift each other up. We thank you for that. And at this time, may I decrease and you increase, Lord. Amen. It is good to be here today. Good to see you all. The sun shining through the window there. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The School of Rock. <clears throat> now this is not that movie a few years ago where the crazy teacher and the... And honestly, I worked with kids. That's probably something I would gravitate to. I've never seen it, but the guy's pretty funny and I understand he inspired the kids and all of that. But School of the Rock is what I'm thinking of today. I started working with families and youth in the 90s. <clears throat> and there was a story is... As I was thinking this last week about our church being at kind of a little bit of a beginning as we were trying to step out, find our specific focus and direction, as we were coming together as a church family, I started thinking of beginnings. And I started thinking of kindergarten. That wonderful time in your life when it really doesn't matter. And I think honestly the biggest discussion we had in kindergarten was why does the teacher have those weird little blocks in that video? All right, it was some number thing, and I think it affected my math. Okay, someone's a little familiar. Um, but then those basics started coming back to me. And in the 90s, when I started working with families, there was a guy that was starting to write at the time, Robert Fulham, or at least that's how I pronounce it. And there started being posters up and around of his observations of life and he's someone that stops and think and he's a, at one point was a theologian and then went on to doctoral philosophy I don't know all kinds of stuff but he wrote something you're probably familiar with all I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten I think for one time in my after school program I actually had the poster up in the halls um, I've read a lot of his books very interesting guy he is not a religion, well, I don't know, he's, he's interesting. Not necessarily a Saturday afternoon read, but an interesting read. But as I was thinking of those basics, that kept echoing back to me. So I want to share with you, it's a very short couple of minutes, all I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. And that's where he starts. All I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. All I really needed to know about how to live, what to do, and how to be. I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not on top of great hallowed graduate study halls, but there in the sand pile of a little Christian church school. And these are the things that I learned. And he goes on with a list. Share everything. What a good idea. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Moms, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Wives, wouldn't... All right, never mind. Um, don't take things that are not yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. And flush. It's a battle sometimes. All right, anyway. Warm cookies and cold milk really are good for you. Amen. <laughs> Live a balanced life. Maybe not too much. Um, learn some. Think some. Draw. Paint. Sing and dance. Play and work every day. Some. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. I've actually threatened middle school kids to have to hold a rope and walk in a All right, anyway. Be aware of wonder. And not scared of it, but open to it. Remember that little seed in the styrofoam cup, right? The roots went down. And the leaves went up. And nobody really knew why, right? But we're all like that. 
put our roots down and grow. Goldfish, hamsters, and white mice, even that little seed in the styrofoam cup, they all die. And sometimes so do we. And then he goes on, remember the Dick and Jane books. Raise your hand, anybody? All right. The first word you learned, the biggest word of all, look. Right? Do you remember that? Everything you need to know is there somewhere. The golden rule, he goes on to write, love and basic sanitation. Ecology and politics and equality and sane living is all in this list in kindergarten. Take any of those things, extrapolate it out into the sophisticated adult terms, and I got lost. And apply it to your life, your work, government, your world, and it all holds true and clear and firm. Think what a better world this world would be if we had cookies and milk about 3 o'clock every afternoon, and then we lay down with our blankies for a nap. Or, this is even a bigger deal than back in 1990, if all the governments had the basic policy of put things back where you found them and clean up your own mess. It's all still true, no matter how old you are, and when you go out into the world, it's best to hold hands and stick together. I loved, I don't know if I necessarily memorized this list because my mind doesn't work really well with memorization, um, but really neat fundamental things. But as we stop and look, the reality is that's the world, right? A lot of these things to, do ring true to our true success book, the Bible. So today I want to spend a little bit of time taking a look at that. Is there a basic formula? Is there something small that we can build on like the all I needed to know I learned in kindergarten? So what Just like in most schools, we need to agree on a few basic things, right? In school, we all agreed. Look was spelled L-O-O-K. Now, obviously, we jumped to another language. We've got a whole different program, right? Um, two plus two equals four. That's a really cool thing. Now, interesting enough, my college roommate is now Dr. Gary Case, astrophysicist, and I was not a math person. Barely knew my multiplication tables. Two plus two equals four. Our junior year, he was taking theoretical mathematics. He walked in one day and said, Tim, guess what? Two plus two does not necessarily equal four. And I said, stop, stop right here. I barely know my multiplication. It, we're done. And I, anyway, sadly, he's one of those people that is intelligent, but could he explain it? But I said, no. But just like we agree, two plus two equals four. We need to agree on a few things before we build from there. The first thing, if we can't agree on, we can't move a whole lot further. And that is new life comes from Christ's sacrifice, right? Without the death of Christ on the cross, there is no cleansing from sin. Without the cleansing of sin, there is no possibility of a new life. We may have them memorized. It may be pretty familiar. 1 John 1, 7. If you can turn with me, going towards the back. 1 John 1, 7. One of the support texts for this. First John 1 John 1.7 But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. John 3.16, we can all probably say, and we don't need to turn, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So that's our first foundation piece. New life comes from Christ's sacrifice. Number two, life in Christ demands that we die to ourself and our sinful nature. Galatians 2.20. You can either write this down to look at later, or you can turn there. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And this is a hard concept for us, right? We as humans, we want to do it ourselves. But it's only when we are looking towards that pure model of Christ that we're able to move outside ourselves. So life in Christ demands that we die to ourselves, my own control. And then the third thing, if we are dead to sin, start turning Romans 6, 6. If we are dead to sin, what next? What are we supposed to do? Romans 6, 6, and 11. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Wait, am I where I want to be? Knowing, sorry, we'll go to the, we'll go to the cheat sheet. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And then down to 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ for our Lord. So that's the foundation that we need. New life comes from Christ, right? There's no other options. I can work really, really hard and do really, really, really good, but unless I'm in Christ, nothing next. Life in Christ demands that we die to ourselves. That's how we begin that process. And if we are dead to sin, then what next? Okay, yeah, so what next? If we can turn over Matthew 16, 24. And we'll be staying here, but it's actually found in three of the four Gospels. A challenge that Christ put out to his disciples. So what's been happening um, just a little bit before this, a few pages ahead, feeding of the 4,000, Jesus is healing the multitudes, um, Pharisees, Sadducees are coming in, kind of picking on Jesus, trying to trip him up, all of those things. Um, a little bit before is where our memory verse came today, where Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So what's the challenge that he laid out there? Um, Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, that's where we're all headed, right? Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And this is where we're going to be today. It is amazing. Three different places. Matthew 16, 24. It's also found in Mark 8, 34 and 37. And Luke 9, 23 to 26. Almost identical words in each one of these. And, and we know, as we've studied the Gospels, it's a different person telling the story. But there are a few key points where they totally mirror each other. Other times it takes on their personalities and the audience that they were going after. But in this, the only primary difference is, in Luke it says, deny oneself daily. Almost word for word in the three Gospels. So what does this mean? Deny yourself. Does that mean I need to go hide in a cave and eat only grass seeds and water or what? No, it, it's not talking about, and it's interesting, the Andrew's Study Bible I've really enjoyed, and it's um, some of the commentary that's, that they have on the Mark 8. And it talks about, this is not a call to be a has ascetic. I had to look that up. But basically that means one that denies self all material things, right? We don't have to be the monk hiding with no light. When the sun goes down, we don't see anything. That may be the right calling for some people, but it's not saying deny yourself of all of that. It's not of material things. It's not a call to self-hatred, you know, the, the way back in the day when people were whipping themselves and all of that because that's the only way we can get to God. But it's a call to cease to make oneself the center and object of one's own thoughts and actions. Right? The whole Bible is telling us that. That I need to give up myself and turn to Christ. Many, many stories, right? In the Bible, our subject, our hero, our biblical character 
They put themselves aside, and it's only through putting themselves aside in the strength of Christ or God that takes them through. But sometimes we learn best from the opposites. Absalom. All right, obscure character. Not all of us talk about him a whole lot. Anyone remember whose son was he? King David. He had beautiful hair. I imagine he was one of the younger princes. He was not in line to be king. But he thought he should. I'm betting he had the coolest black horses or white horses or whatever was the rage at the time, the best chariot to fly around the town, and he started poking and mixing things up, right? Absalom, the total opposite, building himself, and it actually split the kingdom. David, so the fight didn't happen there by the temple of the Lord, left the city, right? You remember them going across the river. Then the fight happens and Absalom ends up with his beautiful hair tied in a tree and some spears of David's generals taking him out. The total opposite of denying yourself. And it ended up, right, with his demise. But since we're in the family, David. Now David had all kinds of times where he was kind of there. And kind of not. Um, uh, but not long ago, we talked quite a bit about, right, this, the, the five stones that he picked up. Going after the giant. And it was only through the strength of God. Not himself that took down that giant, right? It was his own personal experience with God when he was taking care of the sheep in the past. That he knew that he could step out. When they were finally, the giant was calling out and all the brave soldiers were, were hiding away, he said, nope, this isn't right. And only through God, threw the armor aside and went out and made it through. But one of the amazing ones, stoning of Stephen, Acts 7, 54 through 60 is the story there. You may want to write it down. Um, but in one of the greatest human pains, right? I don't, sometimes I think of the stonings of some guy picking up some huge boulder and just hitting someone and that's it. My understanding is that's not how the stonings went back in the day. Through extreme human pain and slowly breaking down of the body. And Stephen sitting there, seeing the throne of God and praying for the people throwing the stones at him. That is denying thyself and being filled with God. So deny yourself. What's the next? Take up his cross. And like we mentioned earlier, Luke said daily. Let's not forget that. So what does that mean? Christ was amazing at throwing out those word pictures, right? Those things that instantly his audience would be like, I know exactly what's going on there. Take up your cross. A few things are very interesting there. He was talking to the disciples and the people around him. Take up his cross, if you notice there, is lowercase. I've always thought of this verse as taking up Christ's cross. But the picture there that he's sharing... Let's go back to the day, right? In the Greco-Roman world, crucifixion was the way that they totally wiped someone out. And one of the things, one of the pieces of the crucifixion, right? They talk about literally having holes along the road where people would walk up and they're like, oh, you're number 24 in that hole right there. And you're dragging your cross with you. You knew what was going to happen, right? Um, in the commentary, the Andrews Study Bible commentary, it talks about um, this was a total picture of the tyranny of the Roman control. Death on the cross was the most shameful method of execution in ancient Greco-Roman world. You would hang there on the side of the road with your crimes above your head. The crime against Rome and Caesar... Adding to the shame was the practice of demanding that the prisoner carry his own cross to the pla place of execution. This act signified the prisoner's total submission to Roman power. They had no choice there, right? Typically, there were probably three or four Roman soldiers, or at least the line of them, if they're taking a bunch of them. You didn't have a choice, right? 
The amazing thing is Christ is asking us in a different way to choose to give ourselves up. This was a total opposite of the picture flashed in their mind, but then they're realizing Christ is asking them, you can make this choice and you will get freedom from this choice. Unlike four or five Roman soldiers walking along and forcing you to do it. Does that make sense? Christ is giving, asking us to give ourselves up totally and completely, submitting to him and doing it willingly. He's asking in love for us to do this, not four or five Roman soldiers forcing us along. So what's a story in the Bible that kind of is an example of this? And I thought of Joseph as a slave, right? He was given this great dream that he was going to be the boss and the cool guy and all of this. He got the cool clothes, and then his brothers threw him in a pit, right? And then he's off to be a slave. Okay, God, not really understanding, but I give this to you, right? And pretty soon... He's a slave in Potiphar's house. And he is recognized as someone that's accountable, that's good, that's positive. And all is going really well. And then Potiphar's wife jumps in. And then he goes to jail. Lord, really? I give this cross to you. I give this burden to you. I don't understand, but only through you. Right? And ends up saving his own family. Saving all of Egypt. Saving the whole area around and moved to a status next to, at that time, was almost a god, or at least in some people's eyes, the pharaoh. He gave it all away. And the last bit, follow me. We talk about our mission is to create disciples, right? The call to discipleship demands cross-carrying submission. John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. For I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Follow him. Be connected to him. And what is that fruit? Stuff that's not really inherent to humans, right? I like to joke. My, my father was a very good example in patience. Probably three or four times I remember him yelling at us. Now, I could tell in other tones that things were not good. Um, and I remember working once with some kids, and some kid, I can't remember, spat on me, bit on me, did something crazy, whatever. And the other staff later are like, Tim why didn't you hit that kid in the face? I'm like, that's hereditary. I joked with them. And one of them was like, no, no, really, really, Tim, how? I said, honestly, I said, do you really want to know? It's not me. I said, I had a good example. I also know the kid didn't know what he was doing. And Christ's example. That's the only way I did it. Oh, all right. Right, they totally missed it. Shoot lower, Sheriff, they're riding Shetlands. Um, Get it? Short horses? All right, sorry. Personal issue. Uh, the fruit, these are not inherent things, right? And most of us can, can quote the fruit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Not a natural mode, right? Joy, peace. How many struggle with joy this week? Peace this week? Um, Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. If we follow Christ, we bear these fruits, right? That's kind of a hint. I guess I'm missing the mark. Um, our Lord, you're really working on this area. Thank you is what I'm supposed to say, right? Um, that's another study, a whole other time. So, bearing that fruit. The fruit can be those examples, those activities. But it can also be that conversion, that person. You know, I, I think of um, early Acts. Um, Acts 8.26, Philip, hanging out, doing what he thinks he's supposed to do. 
And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord says, go. And we don't understand it, but how the Bible describes it, we got this like teleportation kind of a thing, and he arrives with this Ethiopian guy. What's an Ethiopian guy? He's riding in a chariot. That means he's well-to-do. He was a leader of men, we find out later, as you study into that a little bit more. And moves from, hey, guess what? Oh, this is happening. Baptism, and then poof, he's gone. Will that be us? Who knows? But standing in the grocery line, if we are open to it and that fruit is there, the Lord will give us the words. That is not a natural mode for me. Hey, how you doing? Um, uh, I can smile and be nice, but doing that ask, are you feeling blessed today? That's not natural. It's only the Spirit of the Lord through me. And we don't know what difference that can make. So, Let's review. Seems like a school thing to do, right? What's your favorite kindergarten thing? Shout it out. Cookies and milk are really good for you. Anyone for the nap thing? All right, amen. Put things back where you got them, government. All right, anyway, whole nother seminar. But what are we talking about here? Like the simple words in the kindergarten story, Jesus gives us simple guidelines to follow. This is only a starting point. This one verse, but it gives us three things to focus on. And as we grow up in Christ, if we stay with this, then he will help us grow further as we study. Mark 8, 34 and 37, there's a wrap up. When he had called his people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains his whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He calls us for these three things. Self-denial, take up a cross, and follow Jesus. These are not one day or one time actions. It's a daily thing that we're asked to do as we continue to grow personally and as a church family so that we can reach those around us. May we continue to grow with him. Our closing hymn, 309, and a prayer for us all, I surrender all.